morning, everyone, um, for our press availability from the uh, Senate majority this morning. Um, we want to thank you for coming. We, uh, Senator Anna McKinnon and I are here, and uh, we, we had a brief um, press conference last week on the Senate Bill 70 rollout. Wanted to give you a follow-up availability if you have any follow-up questions on that bill. And uh, just for the public's sake that may be listening, I, we feel that we're executing our plan. We, we talked to you at the beginning of the uh, session, and we said that we would be working on reductions to the budget, putting a spending limit in place, and restructuring the permanent fund to help cover the fiscal gap this year. Um, this bill, Senate Bill 70, covers two of those three objectives. It uh, provides for a reasonable amount of funding at a conservative level that does uh, several things. First of all, it ensures the health of the um, corpus. It uh, has a reasonable draw. It has a spending limit on the top end and a revenue limit, which diversifies, um, further diver diversifies use of the uh, earnings, of course. And it pays out uh, slightly under the traditional um, permanent fund dividend. This bill is going to be heard starting this morning. This week it will be joining up with the other permanent fund bills that are coming out of uh, Senate State Affairs. It's going to be heard this morning at 9 a.m. where we'll hear from Senator McKinnon's staff and legislative finance. Then Wednesday at 9 a.m. where we'll hear from Revenue Law and the Permanent Fund Corporation about the effects of the bill. Um, we've been asking very specific questions to make sure that the draw wasn't overly uh, generous, to make sure that we never put the corpus at risk. And from every expert uh, testimony we've received, that's the news that we've heard from them as well, um, that we, we are in that range that secures, um, absolutely ensures the security of, of the corpus itself. So. I'm uh, not one for going on for very long. Um, Senator, do you uh, have a brief lead in and then we'll go to questions? I'm good. You're good. Um, one thing I would like to say, which is kind of uh, fun, I have my list of pages and pages of sign-ins from many of us went home over the weekend. I have a, I didn't count the crowd that was there, but I have pages and pages full of sign-ins. I had a meeting at home. We covered this plan. Um, it was interesting. I, I expected more of a some negativity from the meetings and you know even the Facebook Comments and things like that have been very positive. The meeting was very positive. I think people are starting to understand the limited um, Choices that we have to solve this fiscal gap. So I, I was encouraged by that packed house standing room only um, Very good meeting in a very conservative district. So I was I was pleased with that outcome so uh, with that being said, let's go to the press for questions. Becky. Becky Bohr with the Associated Press. Um, on the issue of the, uh, the revenue limit and the appropriation limit, um, do you see those as um, duplicative? Do they, are they essentially trying to do, each trying to do the same thing? Could you do, accomplish what you wanted with one or the other? Go ahead, Senator. Becky, thanks for the question. I, I think that you can, but I think there's comfort in having both. Uh, one of the things that having the revenue uh, limit uh, is the play between how it affects our savings as well as the health and, of the corpus uh, of the fund. So they work together, they dovetail together, and we hope uh, to uh, provide the public additional trust, uh, a secondary factor that's in the formula that uh, slows the growth of government and points us towards saving dollars and not using uh, earnings from the permanent fund in a way that isn't exactly outlined in state statute. So can I just add a brief? The, the part that I like about was two things. First of all, we're, we're ensuring the public that we don't intend to make available when the price of oil turns around a lot of extra revenue that's going to get us back in the position where we started. We've cut 44.6 percent out of this budget in four years, 25 percent out of the operating budget, right? Mm -hmm. We have no intention of climbing back up to where we are. If, if anything, we are looking at Anchorage CPI or another similar index 
in which to um, increase the cost of our government just as costs increase naturally, not by adding departments and positions. And furthermore, what I like about it is the diversification of oil into uh, reducing our reliance on the corpus, or on, the, on the earnings reserve, right? So by putting a $1.2 billion limit, after that, every amount of volatile revenue will reduce the draw by that amount. So that means when oil prices are high, you actually are diversifying with between the value of oil that we produce and our sovereign wealth, if you will. Um, that ensures people as well. If you look 10 or 12 years down the road with the growth of the fund, eventually the fund will, will provide a sustainable level of um, revenue, even in times of shortfalls with oil prices, that will keep us from having to ever need a broad-based tax in this state. So the more that gets redeposited back into the corpus, the healthier uh, we will be in the long term. Nat? Good morning, Nat Hers with Alaska Dispatch News. Um, I'm wondering, when was the last time uh, you, each of you guys heard from the governor, and what, what have you been hearing from him this session? Well, I, uh, I can say personally that I hear from him often. Um, we're in touch with the governor's office. I, I, it sounds to me that um, folks are starting to come around that if we successfully pass three bills this session that we would have a very successful session, one being the operating budget, the capital budget, and restructuring bill, whichever one makes it to the finish line. Um, we know that uh, when you add the other things in, such as extreme cuts or broad-based taxes from the House, that you begin to politically complicate the one solution that must pass this year, and that is a restructuring bill. I think we're in agreement. I'm not going to speak for the governor, but I will say that my most current meetings have been very positive that we all understand that bill has to pass this year. Liz. Good morning. Liz Rains with KTVA. Um, Senate Bill 70 is, of course, just one piece of the fiscal solution that the Senate's proposing, um, as well as the $300 million in cuts this year. The House has um, put forward a, a a big proposal in terms of the legislator, legislature's budget um, cutting legislative per diem by 75 percent of the uh, federal rate is uh, should that be part of the fiscal solution from the Senate's perspective as well? Senator. Thank you Liz. I think that the Senate will uh, look at whatever the House advances towards us and we'll use that as part of uh, balancing the budget. The Senate will try to come up with our own proposals in addition to what the House advances in the legislative budget. And for me, the easy answer is absolutely the legislature needs to be leading the pack on the reductions that we're willing to take in our budget. We, we, um, it, it certainly makes it easier when I go home and I say, well, here's my list of what I've spent in the last five years because I like to be on the bottom of the pack for spending. And, um, and these other reductions we're going to look at on how much we spend every day when we're getting our business done for you, not only while we're in session, but all year long. And we've made some significant inroads, and you'll see a somewhat dramatically reduced budget as we move forward. Steve. Hi, uh, Steve Quinn with Bloomberg. Um, last week, you folks, certainly Senator Machicki, um, uh, had noted that if oil goes down dramatically again and stays there, this bill doesn't quite cover that. Why not put a provision in that covers that? Um, We've seen twice in the last 10 years where oil does dip down into the high 20s and low 30s for a sustained period. So the beauty of a POMV is that you have a set value right today. Um, when I talked about an extended period of time, as if the new reset of our commodity price, which is what our state has lived on for the last two generations, um, if there's a sustained period of a lower price and a reset, a substantial reset, where the, the going price of oil is going to be in the mid-20s or low 30s, we are going to have to eventually evaluate a broad-based tax. That's just reality. And I make my decisions with a calculator. I don't make it with rhetoric or some of the other things you hear in this business. I mean, that's just, that's just reality. However, the POMV philosophy on its own gives you time to respond to that condition. 
right now things seem relatively stable and um, with a POMV draw such as we're looking at through Senate Bill 70 or whichever bill makes it to the finish line um, that's still a next year's conversation and we're still have the fiscal gap solved at the 90% level now and or close to the 90% level now and with a um, using this fall forecast we have a balanced budget by 2024 so that's something we're going to have to evaluate we're also going to reevaluate this bill as we move forward so um, there may be adjustments um, and we'll just have to take it as the as the uh, financial conditions are presented going forward but for today and for the next um, time horizon of two to three years, we know that this POMV is adequate for the percentage that we're um, wanting it to cover. I don't. Andrew. Andrew, I'm sorry, Andrew. Andrew Kitchman, Alaska Public Radio Network. So um, th the uh, Representative Seaton has uh, given as one of the main reasons for an income tax the idea of balance that uh, reducing PFDs and cutting government services would disproportionately affect uh, lower income residents. Uh, what's your, your response to that? Andrew, when I um, am talking to constituents at home, I've, I've heard that uh, brought up multiple times. And I asked them if they could uh, listen a, a little bit more to a, another perspective that I hear. And that is that uh, those that, that are lower income in our state are predominantly receiving more services than the rest of the state is benefiting from. So those that are currently paying federal tax and have a job, are earning employment and providing for their families, are helping through their federal taxes to provide services all throughout the state of Alaska. So when you look at uh, the Medicaid program as an example, the money that we're using there uh, folks of lower income are reliant on programs that we already have established and people are already contributing in many different ways uh, through uh, uh, the state and through their federal taxes and so that's my response is that you know that's absolutely fair to make uh, make that assertion that uh, families are disproportionately affected but it's also fair to say those particular families those families in need of basic services are receiving those services um, that the other families are not, and that our state has been paying for those services over time. Go ahead, Nat. Um, Nat Hurst with Alaska Dispatch News. Will, um, will, will the public see specific line item proposed cuts to individual departments from the Senate this year, or is the, is the Senate going to be proposing um, like unallocated cuts to any department? Well, I, it's uh, it's it wouldn't be our place to um, predict what the various subcommittees are going to do to reach their goals. Um, I can speak for the Health and Social Services Committee budget, which is the budget that I have, and uh, for my reductions, you will see line item reductions. I, I definitely believe that's the best way to go. It's uh, a lot of these cuts are going to be in departments that are painful. They're programs that we all support. They're things that we're going to have to go home and defend. Um, but we do have we do have a challenge, and we have a responsibility to deliver the lowest possible cost.